Unleashing Communication, Story-Based Strategies and Tools, hosted by HRDQU and presented by Terrence Gargiulo. Today's webinar will last around one hour. If you have any questions, you can always type them into the questions box. We will be answering questions as they come in live at the end of the presentation or as they follow up by email. My name is Sarah Schaefer, and I will be moderating today's webinar. Terrence works as an internationally recognized organizational development consultant, which earned him the 2008 HR Leadership Award from the Asia Pacific HRM Congress for his groundbreaking research on story-based communication skills. He is the author of eight books, and along with his sister, founded the Okiata Foundation which brings art engagement to schools through the multidisciplinary prism of opera. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Oh, super. Well, Sarah, thanks so much for the invitation and a, and a huge shout out to HRDQ for, for sponsoring these and bringing us all together as, as a community. Um, I, I asked at the beginning of the webinar where some folks are from. And I do hope I can send some sunshine and some warmth. I'm sitting today in, in Monterey, California, and you're looking at a picture of our gorgeous coastline. And once a year, for any of you who've ever traveled to Monterey, and I'm sure we've got folks out there um, that have, we have this ice plant, which is not indigenous to the coastline of Monterey. And it just it flowers across and creates this purple carpet. And this morning, I, I asked my um, daughter if she wouldn't mind if I would share, I'm going to take that back a slide here, if she wouldn't mind if I would share a picture from her about two years ago. That's, that's Sophia Rose Gargiulo, my daughter. And um, that's our, our beautiful um, coastline, and it looks. But thank you to those who are dialing in from St. Louis and Kentucky and Albany and all kinds of different places, Sacramento, California, Honolulu just came in, I see popped in. Um, so really, it's great to be together. What I'd like to do is share with you an area of great passion for me, and I imagine that it's something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, and, and that's how we can leverage stories as um, an effective means of communication. And I think all of us all know about the Hollywood stories. We all know about how it's more interesting to tell stories. So I'm hoping to get at some nuances and hoping to explore some of the ways in which in any form of training, we can facilitate reflective conversations. And in particular, about 14 slides into the presentation, after a little pre-ramble and, and some setup, we're going to look at a tool, um, a very simple tool for um, ways of triggering and eliciting stories that then also can be used um, for the conversations that take place in our trainings. I've got some case studies to share about that. and. Um, Oh my gosh, I just saw someone from Brazil. Awesome. Sorry, I just had to call that out. Um, so we'll look at a case study and also try to look across a spectrum of learning because I realize probably on the phone, maybe we have some people who do leadership development. Maybe we have people who do compliance training. Maybe we have people who don't do training at all but are more interested in organizational uses of informal learning that occurs in, in different times and places in the organization. So I really hope to get your voices in at, at looking at that. And we'll wrap up then by looking at just some strategies for how you can go about um, starting to put this in place. So again, bear with me, maybe about seven or eight slides here, um, and, and there will be some opportunities in those first seven or eights to get your feedback and ideas. But um, just some, some setup here. Um, is anyone, please type in, I have one question here around issues with the audio. Um, if anyone is experiencing that as well, please let us know. We'll do our best on the technical end to address any audio issues. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, and I want everyone there in the silence of their own office or their space that they're receiving this webinar to complete that. If a picture is worth a thousand words, what's a story? A story is worth a thousand pictures, right? So. So we use stories as more compelling and rich ways, not just for encoding our messages, but really about making sense of the world. And I think one of the most important things that we ever do in a learning environment is help people make sense of new information and attach that to their existing set of experiences, their existing set of knowledge. 
So being able to tap into people's stories is fundamental really to how people learn, how people communicate. And it's something that we want to be really thoughtful and mindful about in how we design, um, how we design and do our stuff. So I've got a quick um, little poll here that I want to launch. And um, just very quickly, just give me a sense, um, those of you who are out there, how many of you right now in any way, fashion or another, actively use stories in either the design or delivery of your interventions? So we'll just give people a, a, a second there. Sarah, I'm, gonna, I'm just curious, do you have any prediction here of what you expect um, um, these numbers to come out? She didn't know I was going to call on her. Okay. I think she, uh, she said she expects roughly maybe about 40% of, of folks to sort of maybe occasionally use them. Let me share this, uh, share this poll. So that was a pretty accurate uh, prediction, Sarah. Um, it looks like people are using stories and maybe a little oh, close to 50% of the time. So that's, that's great. There are some of you out there that are using it extensively. And I'm definitely interested in getting some of your um, some of your thoughts and ideas. So going back to our slides, um, I'd like to have you then share with us using the question box, um, using the question box. Share with us some of the ways in which you are currently using storytelling in your learning um, initiative. So just type in, and I'm seeing already. I apologize, some people are still having some issues with audio fading in and out. Um, we'll do our best to continue to um, address that. Sometimes that's on our end and sometimes it's on yours, so I apologize. And some of the answers coming in so far, consumer research learning. So that's interesting. Carol, Carol had that to offer, and that must be focus groups. Carol, you could maybe say something more about it role playing. Um, Amy would love to have you type in a little more detail about um, different role ways in which you are using stories in role plays. Um, sharing stories and experiences, debriefing a learning activity, um, someone uses scenarios in HR training, um, customer service training. That must be really rich because you're able to draw upon not just the representatives but even stories of customers themselves. That must lead to innovation and changes. Um, let's see, taking risks and learning from failure. So that might be after action reviews when people are working on projects. Um, Alice talks about the beginning of the class to set the problem for the content, the summary, the activity to demonstrate. Sales training, field trips, um, leadership training, engagement, um, using real life applications, making concepts live. Um, here's a wonderful one from um, Kevin, who talks about patient experience stories in the health giver or caregiver environment and, and looking at how that can influence empathy training and compassion. And I think you're hitting upon something really important that goes beyond even those settings of the healthcare setting, Kevin. I think we're talking about how stories really activate our imaginations because they're little virtual reality simulators. Um, Lots of super examples, um, and um, I'll get with Sarah afterwards that maybe we can also just send back a list to people of all of these. We've got more on role playing. Collect real stories and develop scripts for role playing. I love that. So you start by eliciting people's experiences and then you construct those into role plays and into scripts that you can put into your trainings. Really, really good. Um, someone's working with emotional intelligence and leadership. So we've got tons of rich um, examples here of how stories really do play a role in, um, in our learning, and it looks like some of you are doing some really fantastic stuff. This next slide, um, um, I, was, uh, I was always enamored, I guess, with IBM, and they always had these great graphics that had architectures. This is going back to the early days of client server when people were starting to use computers and whatnot. And I, and I said to myself, you know what, I really think we need to um, have a learning architecture. And so I kind of put this together. And when I look and think about what we have as learning professionals, I feel really blessed. You know what, guys? We have so many tools, 
so many processes, so many rich ways that we can touch people in, in learning. And this sort of allows me to, to say that at a foundational level, once we get past the fact that we've got to start with subject matter expertise, and then we apply um, our principles of solid instructional design. And then, of course, we've got the wonderful uh, contributions made by graphic artists and those who can help us to visualize ideas and concepts and information. And then, right alongside of all of that is story-based design. Um, so how we think about constructing the story of our training, how we think about how we're going to create opportunities for reflective conversation, and really, you know, some people might stop and say, hey, Terrence, that's all fine and good if you're talking about soft skills and leadership. But, you know, I do compliance training, or I do technical training, or I do um, process training. You know, how and why would I even think about using any type of story design and, and how I put those together? And I would argue that really story-based design is prevalent in any type. Um, and I think this slide for me does celebrate all of the different ways in which we are able to be effective as um, learning and development um, uh, professionals. And I hope that you also feel as passionately as I do that, that stories are at the heart of um, um, that work. So, uh, let's see, go back to that slide. Um, Ending up here with just, as I said, a little bit of the setup material. The shortest distance between two people is a story. So this gets us to the, the notion that stories are relational. Stories are relational in terms of people. Stories are relational in terms of how we, of how we connect to information. Um, and what we're doing is we're putting people at the center of that. And so stories help to really accelerate the connections that people are making um, between uh, themselves. I have a really fun story here that, that, that I'll share. Um, it was part of an organizational development intervention, and this was with a, a company in the Detroit area. And it was um, actually the merger between Michigan Gas and Detroit Edison. And we were working with the IT teams. And the, the two teams of people um, on one side, it, it really was very diametrically opposed. So one organization, and this was a, a more of an acquisition than really a merger. So there was all of that, that tension around change and around us versus them. And one of the IT organizations was all open source. They did. Um, used all open source technologies, and the others were all using proprietary um, uh, technologies, Microsoft or Oracle or whatever they happened to be. And the differences went on and on. Uh, another one had different software development life cycles. And so there wasn't a lot of trust between these groups, and there was a lot of jockeying for what was going to be the way in which things were going to be done. So we um, took these folks and we said, we're going to stick you in cars because one of the things that happens in the utility industry, and we might have people, um, we might have people on the phone who work in that industry, is that all everything stops when there are snowstorms. I'm sure a lot of you are laughing right now because you've lived through some really rough snowstorms this season. But everything um, stops, and people will go out into the field and actually guard wires that have gone down. So a live wire is very dangerous, um, and people could get electrocuted and damaged by it. So what we said is we're going to put people from the two different organizations in the same car with one another. Because if you're sitting out there, it's freezing cold, and you're stuck with maybe a cup of coffee, maybe a donut or something, what are you going to do if you've got to sit out there for five, six hours with someone? You're going to have to swap stories. So it accelerated the relationships, accelerated trust. And I'll come back to that example in, um, a little bit later. The other good news is um, in the research that I've done, story um, skills are natural. I think we tend to think of storytellers as being the person who can stand up and wow us with the great story, the great orators, the Steve Jobs. 
And I don't mean to in any way take away from that aspect of storytelling. It's critical. And being able to stand up and being effective as a storyteller um, is important. However, we all are natural storytellers because it's really how we communicate, learn, and think. And my research has demonstrated that there are um, nine basic skills which are characterized here. So storytelling is an innate capacity and it's something that we all are able to do and as such um, we are able to help each other develop as um, effective storytellers. And I can, I'll talk a little bit more about that, uh, about that later. Um, the one little example that I'd, I'd, I'd want to give quickly there is everybody in your mind who's seen the movie, think about 12 Angry Men. That's the movie with Henry F uh, Fonda. It takes place in the summer, deep in the south. There's no air conditioning. It's humid, and it's a murder trial. And the jurors go into the jury room, and 11 or so of the jurors it looks like they're all going to agree very quickly. I can't remember if the person's guilty or, or innocent. I, I can't remember which way the, the jury was swinging. And um, right at the very, very last moment, Henry Fonda, who plays this quiet character, just introduces, almost in a whisper, another perspective, a question, another piece of the story that maybe the jurors hadn't yet considered. And suddenly, everything changes. So take that image. Oh, thank you. And um, Allison just uh, uh, told me that they all were voting guilty at first. Thanks, Allison. She's a good movie buff. Um, it, what that image is also a really good image of understanding storytellers. You know, sometimes in a group, it's not the person who can tell the story really well or captivate us. It's, the, it's that person who shares maybe even just in a sentence or two a piece of information. And we've all experienced as facilitators how quickly the group dynamics can, can, can change. So as designers and deliverers of training, stories are about breaking down that didactic mode of conversation. And I'm, you know, it's kind of ironic that here we are on a webinar. Um, you know, we've got however many 300, 400 plus people on the webinar now, and everyone's voice is silent and you're stuck with me just didactically kind of um, yakking at you. But um, really what we care about most is those conversations and stories really help to bridge so that information just isn't didactic. In any setting, when we bring people together, we've got a wealth of experience. People are treasure chests of stories and we store our experiences as stories. So if we're not as learning professionals thinking and challenging ourselves to say, how do we get a return on all of that experience in the room, um, then we're missing a huge opportunity to help people really make fundamental shifts in either their behavior, you know, in their behaviors or in connecting more effectively with one another. So reflecting, helping people to both elicit and connect those stories allows them to take those experiences and build upon them and to transfer that knowledge to one another, which will indeed result in uh, the possibilities of performance improvement. So another opportunity to, to get, you guys um, had so much to share on the first question, so I got another one. I'm interested, when you are, let's say, facilitating a group, what do you do to draw out stories from the group? How do you trigger them? How do you get stories going? Um, uh, when when you have group discussions. Oh, right out of the bat, Amanda hits one straight to my heart. She says, start with a story of your own. Um, similarly, um, Alice and um, some others say, um, tell stories, you know, tell more, ask questions, um, tell about a time, super. Um, let's see, get personal stories. Um, compare experiences, excellent. Use direct questions. Um, can you collaborate on that for us all? Can you elaborate on that? Very good questions. These are all good. Use a lot of open-ended questions. You're so right, Amy. Have the types of questions we use is critical in terms of making people comfortable and, and allowing them to, to come forward. 
Um, someone says, maybe use a best and worst experience. Um, paint a picture. Karen, that's a great idea. We really need to use our words to create word pictures. Um, have people turn to the person next to them and swap stories. Um, praise participation. Use icebreaking questions. Um, another person talks about Joseph Campbell's hero cycle as a framework to help leaders learn from their experiences. Excellent. Yeah. Um, the hero's journey is a really important archetype in, in any um, story work. Um, how about making it your own, choosing your own ending? So you maybe start a story and then you get people to participate in, in ending it. Um, sharing stories in pair. Layout of the room needs to be conducive. Um, compare two outcomes from two different stories offered by an audience. So again, a lot of good ideas here, and these are all um, things that, that do work um, well. Okay, so one, one tool that people, you can always use if you're thinking about how you want to trigger stories um, is um, timelines. People um, tend to think about things um, or organize things in their minds in, in terms of timelines. You know, an example might be if you were if you were working with a group and you wanted to have them do an after action review. So it's been a two year long project, and you're bringing people together, and you want um, to get those lessons learned. Then you could put up um, maybe it's the the eight quarters of that project, or maybe it's month by month, or maybe it was critical months where there were milestones, and you could get people to um, try to remember key events and key things, and then you can drill in from there and ask them follow-up questions and get them to, to, to share. Um, so timelines are really one good way. Many of you mentioned uh, another way which is really um, um, which is really important. Um, I, I apologize, there's a loud noise outside my office which I don't have control over. Hopefully it will stop. Um, stories beget stories. So here we have this image of the, of the dominoes that are um, collapsing upon one another. And the fastest way to, to get people to tell stories, and many of you said this, is tell a story. Stories will beget stories. So here are also three steps um, that you can also use for eliciting stories. And the first will link back to the example I gave of the two utility companies that merged together. And remember the story I told of them having to sit in the car together. And suddenly they've got this um, opportunity where they're going to have a shared experience. They're going to actually have a bunch of joint stories because now they sat out there for five hours together and just like when you're stuck on a plane, I'm sure some of you have experienced this, you're stuck on a plane, maybe you don't even feel like talking to the person sitting next to you, but suddenly they say something about, oh, my daughter is going to be in a, um, a symphony concert this afternoon, I'm really worried about getting back in time tonight in order to be able to see her. And suddenly the other person also has a child or um, has some connection to symphony orchestras and music, and off the two of you go, and suddenly stories are flowing. So um, creating trust is really the first step for eliciting stories. And one of the ways we do that is by celebrating or by building history with others, creating shared experiences. And the second way in which we do it, I think is, and many of you mentioned these in the examples that, um, that you used, you said, there's, there's got to be sort of an esprit de corps to the, the group dynamic. People have to feel comfortable. They have to feel invited. You have to thank people for their contributions. So instilling a climate of, of sharing this. And many of you also mentioned the importance of modeling first um, the sharing of stories. So if, if you're sharing stories, then that's going to open up the door for others to feel that, hey, the norms of this group are okay. People are, are sharing stories. I guess it's okay for me to do so. And I think it's really hard for people to be um, vulnerable 
it's hard for transparency and it's hard sometimes for people because they're not used to being vulnerable or being um, um, transparent to some degree and stories make us very vulnerable and transparent. They don't know where the dividing lines are, how far they should go and what's right. So how we model that and, and how we set up the group dynamics is really important. The third area is um, and again, many people um, called, um, called this out as well in their comments, the importance of our questions, the language that we use, um, how we phrase questions. I think it's easy to, to forget that each of us index information in very different ways, and I have a slide on this in just a moment. And so saying a question one way to one person will not elicit a story from every single person. For example, if I said, what's the most funny mm, a scene from a movie you've ever, you know, you've ever seen? Or what's your favorite funny scene from a, mu uh, a movie? Some people will go snap right away. They'll have a great example. They'll have one on the tip of the tongue. Others, that qualifying word of most will make them go, well, I don't really have an index in my head of what, which one is um, the, the most. Oh, I just want to call out a great comment here from, from Kate. Thanks so much. She said, authenticity and respect are necessary to creating trust and um, couldn't, could not agree uh, more. Thanks, thanks Kate, for that, uh, for that comment. So um, these three areas, creating that trust, instilling a climate of sharing, and adapting your language are what we need to do. And by the way, sure, we can put some guidelines in Facilitator when we're, when we're putting together our, um, our notes for other trainers who might be delivering the, the same uh, learnings. But these are very much interpersonal skills that we ourselves have to get comfortable with and be good at so that we can be good modelers. OK, I'm ready now to, to share with you um, the, the tool, um, one of the tools that I have found very useful, very simple, that I, that I use um, with groups, and it's called a, a story, story collage. And um, I'll preface it by saying I am a, real, a firm believer that um, stories in isolation are great. You know, if a picture is worth a story, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a story is worth a thousand picture. But this image of things being collaged together, mosaics, one of the other metaphor that we often use as storytellers is things being woven together like patchwork. Another wonderful metaphor, a story about stories, is the stone soup story, right? And all of those to me are about stories in collections, stories that um, interrelate to one another, stories that are not maybe just by themselves, but really cast light on one another when they are um, shared in relationship to one another and connected to one another. So sometimes there's that great, perfect story that has a classical beginning, Aristilian beginning, middle, and end arc, um, a hero's journey, the big stories that uh, capture our attention. And, and we always want to look for those, without a doubt. And then there are also really stories that um, form their power almost in clusters with one another. And so that's really what we're, what we're going to talk about here now is a way of getting at that. So everyone is familiar with brainstorming. And we know that many people will use different brainstorming or mind mapping techniques as, as a way of uncovering um, ideas. So, this, in, in a sense, is a simple tool, the story collage, for doing brainstorming with stories, except it's a kind of nonlinear. And it's nonlinear because as you look at this, as you look at this simple diagram, and by the way, I, I think out on the HRDQ website, they've already put out in the blog area, and, and maybe Sarah, when she comes in at the end, can, can give everyone a heads up. Um, I think they've put out um, a white paper with um, detailed instructions about story collages and more information. Um, so you'll have a chance to kind of dive into this. Um, and there's even some facilitator guides on how you can use this in, um, in the design and delivery of your learning program. So don't worry about trying to get it all um, right now in this, um, in this 
uh, just in this webinar or just in the slides that I'm sharing. Um, and we'll probably also send a follow-up email with the information as well, so, so no worries. But anyway, nonlinear, I say that because it allows us to work in two directions at the same time. So in the middle of this picture where you see all those lines, our index are where we write keywords or that we would use to index stories that um, are going to be related to the question that we ask a group. Um, and the little bubbles around this diagram are where we write short descriptions of the stories themselves. So you're like, okay, Terrence, that's all a little abstract. Uh, I don't quite get what you're talking about here yet. So let's look at this and let's look at this in a little uh, in detail. Let me first, before I, I show you an example and then we talk about a case study, let me let me just go back and reinforce this idea of um, indexes. So in this diagram, we're going to ask people to work in two directions at the same time. If I posed a question and said, um, tell me about times when you were very effective as a manager, or tell me times when as a leader you, uh, you felt that you were not heard effectively, whatever the question might be. As someone reflects on that, on that question, they can either in the middle start writing down key, key words. Well, gosh, I was angry, I was, I was frustrated. Maybe they're, they're writing down words that characterize the emotions they were feeling. Maybe they start remembering a, a situation and they write down a key word that connects to a situation. For example, they might write down um, New York 2010 because when they were in New York in 2010 at a sales meeting, they had an experience. So that would be an index, a key word that um, is associated with a then story that they might talk about. So I'll come to a full example in a second. But I want to come back to this idea that everyone has uh, unique ways that they classify information. And what we're looking for is how to take those isolated data points and how to begin to connect those to actual experiences. Um, and so this tool allows people to work in two directions at the same time. They can either start by remembering the sales being in New York and that experience that they had in 2010 at the sales conference, or they could start with key words that characterize that event, whichever way their mind works, but they'll be able to work in both directions. So let's look at um, um, the first part of this. So when you use the story collage tool, you're going to start with some opening question to people, um, such as the two examples I used. When um, tell me about a time when, as a leader, you were um, you did not feel you effectively reached um, um, people in your organization. Okay. So you frame it up with a question. And going back to even earlier, we know that we're probably going to frame it up with several questions, right? Not just one. So I might also have a question about, um, as, a, as a leader, um, tell me about people and times where your, where your communication fell flat. What, what, what happened? Right? So I begin to try to frame multiple questions in, in multiple different ways to help different people to index it. Um, did anyone else lose the sound? I, I had one comment here that one person has lost the sound. I hope everyone else still has the sound. If one person could just respond so I know not everyone lost sound, that would be great. Sounds fine. Great. I have sound. Thank you. So. Um, um, really being, these are offered here as examples of the types of language that leads to, to questions. We know close-ended questions aren't effective. Many of you were really good in, in calling out the importance of open-ended questions and how we phrase questions. So framing up the question for the, for the story collage. So I'm going to share um, first a kind of a, a little bit of a personal example. Um, here was one I was I, I was um, asked to write a um, um, an essay. So this is not so much a learning example. This is showing how I use this as a writer. 
Um, and the question that was posed to me was, tell me about some times when you have experienced the power of the ocean. So I um, decided that I was going to do some brainstorming about this using my story collage. And this is, this is, what, I, this is what I came up with. Um, being a storyteller, I actually came up with the stories first, and then I thought about the key words. So I uh, reflected on um, an experience I had as a child at the Carmel Beach in, in Monterey, California, and being pulled in by the undertow, and how, the, how actually I almost drowned, and very dramatic story, right? And that was one of my first experiences of the ocean. I, I had the joy, first as a child, of putting my my ankles into the water, the Pacific Ocean, and feeling the coolness, and then being excited and, and taking a step in a little bit closer, and then suddenly I fell, and suddenly I get pulled in. Okay, so you can see that um, you can see that reflected in that bubble where it says on the beach as a little boy, and then you can see my index, the first index box there has fragile, vulnerable waves, beach, um, drowning. Um, and then there were there were other examples of um, uh, my experience. One of my first experiences of scuba diving in the beautiful kelp beds of, of Monterey, California, and suddenly um, stand, swimming next to kelp. And in Monterey, if anybody's ever been to the Monterey Bay Aquarium or you've seen pictures, the kelp in the Pacific Northwest is actually like a tree. It, it stands straight up from maybe as deep as 70, 80 feet. Um, it, 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 it's not like a rooted plant, but it attaches itself to rocks, and then it climbs all the way up to the surface, reaching to the sun, and can grow about a foot a day. Well, one of the first times that I was swimming in literally a forest of kelp, so you're surrounded by all these beautiful kelps, and the sun is shining through the water, and I saw a fish docked against the kelp, and I had, oh my gosh, I'm relying on the scuba tanks on my back to breathe, but this fish, um, this fish is in water, it's like air, because when I'm in air, not underneath the water, and I breathe, I don't experience it as this um, medium that I'm moving through, I, I just experience it as my environment, and that's what this fish must feel. Anyway. Um, so you can see in the second to last box on the right, um, this characterization or this description of life and breathing and air and oxygen and connection, etc. Okay, well, I'm not going to tell all the stories associated with this, but wanted to give a you know an example of how that tool was used. Now, before I offer you um, a case study, let's just talk for a minute about where we would use these story collages and, and what it would look like across the spectrum of um, learning types of situations. So I think many of you um, offered some examples too about leadership development. I'm sure we've got some great facilitators and designers of, of leadership and storytelling and leadership are, they go hand in hand, right? I mean, they really work very, very well together. And so there are all different kinds of ways in which peer-to-peer -peer learning, um, whether you're doing that in a, in a mentoring environment or whether you're doing it on an off-site retreat or whether you're doing it through a coaching model, any type of leadership development, if, if leaders are sharing their experiences and you're asking them to reflect on them, story collages are going to be a very um, effective uh, and powerful tool. You know, moving from left to right, soft skills, anything around communication, emotional intelligence, any of the areas that we deal with in terms of the soft skills, I think also are, are somewhat um, self-evident um, as to different ways in which we might ask people to reflect on those stories and, and, sh and share them. I think later on, maybe in the, in the Q&A, we, we might want to talk about how do you manage time in learning situations, right? You know, you'd say to me, hey, Terrence, stories are great, and my gosh, I could kill two, three hours having people tell stories, but, you know, I do have some learning objectives I've got to hit, and, and how, do you, how do you do storytelling and still manage time? So I think that's a really important question, and um, I think we also want to talk about how do we honor, um, in many ways, a lot of the 
learning architectures and learning courses that we've put together and introduced storytelling and even a tool like Story Collage without upsetting the apple cart, without you know having to redesign everything from soup to nuts. And there really are ways to address that. I probably won't be able to go um, super deep into any um, into any of those details, but um, write your questions and certainly share that out um, because those are areas to explore. Technical training is surprisingly, depending on the nature of the technical training or compliance training, those are really areas where I think stories have a more prominent role than we assume they do. Um, if you think about Agile, um, anybody who's working in uh, the Agile methodology, we know that requirements are gathered by virtue of, they call them, user stories. Um, and, I, and Carol immediately chimed in here with, and yes, and we can use them for test scripts and user acceptance testing and all kinds of great stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, I think that, that in technical training, um, people need to hear from each other's experiences. We know that there's a lot of knowledge transfer that needs to uh, occur beyond um, the mechanics of oftentimes the training that, that we're doing. And so I think it's important to build in the time and the space so that when you look across the diversity of experiences that um, you have in a training room of technical people, they're able to um, learn from each other. Now, one of the other ways that you can do that is you can also set it up such that not all of that story swapping has to be happening formally in the actual session itself. Sometimes you might just potentiate it, right? Which means that you might encourage it so that during the lunch breaks or during the um, um, any of the other breaks, people are, are realizing, gosh, I need to go talk to so-and-so because it sounds like they've done X, Y, and Z, and so that you get that informal learning happening and that you're, you know, you're potentiating that, you're making that happen. Um, informal learning, of course, Organizational practices, um, how we run focus groups. Someone earlier on mentioned that they use storytelling as, as a way of um, querying groups and understanding you know, pain points of groups. Here's one in from Kim. Stories from firsthand accounts from maintenance folks on um, mechanical failures. Um, you know, give great food for thought in, in helping other technicians and, and people be effective in solving those problems moving forward. Um, another good example from Blanche, thanks Blanche, she says one way is to leverage pre-work too. As we get ready for, this, for the training, maybe we're using wikis or, or internal um, social media uh, vehicles for people to share experiences. Maybe we even have them record short little videos or even audios. They could use um, you know, some of the great um, tools that are out there both uh, on the internet, and then tools that are standardized internally if you have issues around um, you know, security or what gets shared. Um, so there are all different ways of doing that. Okay, so I'd like to give um, a little bit of a case study here. This was, I was working with um, Princess Cruise Lines, and um, one of the things they were actually trying to move towards a story culture, and one of and one of the ways that they were going to do that was to empower um, really everyone that touches a customer, whether it be inside the headquarter offices, or whether it be people who are literally on on the boats working at, as maintenance people, working in the dining rooms, working as concierges working in the health clubs, whatever it happened to be, that they would all become more mindful of the stories around them, that they would become story ambassadors, that they would actually be collecting the stories and sharing them back out, going right back to the point that Kim made, which is there's great intelligence and we want to make sure that that stuff is being shared. And then, of course, you know, if you think about it from a cruise ship standpoint, everything that you do is about how you touch and affect the experience of the customer. So the more examples that you have, not only can you improve your processes and help train and do knowledge transfer, but they also become points of celebration. They become points of um, external marketing as well as internal branding and, and a sense of who and how we are. 
And so one intervention that I did was, uh, across many was to take some of their senior leaders and have them start to reflect on their core values. So you're reading up there the courtesy, respect, I'll let you read it without um, reading at you. Those are some of their core values. So I took a group of those senior leaders and I said, all right, um, I want you to reflect for a few minutes about experiences that you've had, heard, or observed that remind, that remind you or illustrate any of these core values in action. And then for them, I pre-populated the, um, uh, the story collage with, with some of with those core values as a starting point. Um, it looked a little bit different than this. I've, I've kind of made it much bigger. Those were actually just in one or two boxes of the, uh, of the story collage, so there was more room for them to work. Um, and we heard, as you can imagine, all kinds of wonderful stories about how people were in the organization actualizing these values. And what was surprising to them is at first, when you just said, so tell me, how are you doing on these values? You know, if you, if you, opened, up, you opened up the conversation and you said to the leaders, you know, tell me on a scale of 1 to 10, how effective you think in, in this current fiscal year you're delivering on these, on these core values. Um, and it became a didactic com conversation. It really wasn't very rich. And then you said, well, do you guys have examples? And I just threw that out as a question. And you had maybe a few people. And then I gave them the story collage and had them work first by themselves and then put them in small groups and then, of course, did the large, a large group debrief. It was amazing. And more importantly, not only did they hear from each other uh, and realize there was just a wealth of stories of um, one of the ones that really was compelling to me was um, in terms of we do it right and we serve, is one person told this story of how they turned around. There was a, a health, a significant health issue for one of the um, uh, passengers, and they were far enough away from port that it wasn't just a simple job of sending a helicopter or, um, you know, maybe some of their SOPs, their standard operating procedures for dealing with those types of situations weren't adequate for the situation at hand. So do you know what they did? They literally turned the ship around, and um, you know, and they made it up to the other passengers as well um, in terms of other perks. And um, they asked people to to be respectful and helpful and participating. But they coordinated everything that needed to happen so that when they got to that port, all of the right medical care was there. And they were so, and they and they saved a life, right, by uh, by doing it. So they were really proud of across not just helping that customer in need, but how they dealt with that from beginning to end, even with the customers who were not directly impacted by the health issue, they were proud of that they had served and they had done what was right. Um, so really super example. Um, the response to stories brings synchronization. So what we see happening is as people open up with, with some vulnerability and with some trust or they begin to share these experiences, it, it, it's like a pitchfork. When you take a pitchfork and you knock it against a surface, it starts to vibrate. Well, what happens when you take that pitchfork that's vibrating and you hold it next to a dormant pitchfork? That dormant pitchfork starts to vibrate, right? And that's a very much a beautiful metaphor, a visual metaphor for what happens with stories. When you put people next to one another and they start striking up within themselves their stories, they start connecting with one another. They also start connecting with themselves in unexpected ways because they're bringing up a wealth of experience from within themselves. And so they're suddenly finding new connections, not just between themselves and others, but even between themselves. And I think that's the old adage that there's a reason why we return to some stories over and over and over again. Um, those who might come from you know, different religious traditions um, are very much knowledgeable that you reread those, those key stories that, that make, a, make up your faith 
over and over again because you're always learning something new from them. And, and it's the same thing with great literature or even great movies. You know, we love seeing them because we see something new in them. Um, so sense giving and sense making is really the work that we do as learning professionals. We are creating a space where people um, can make sense of things and we do that by helping them to remember. What I love about the word remember is it's about putting things back together. Um, it, it's reassembling things. It's taking things that may have been in isolated pieces in our mind or between ourselves and others and suddenly turning them into networks and nodes of, of meaning and remembrance. We also create opportunities for connections to be made. So once we reconstitute these experiences, now suddenly they're, they're alive. Imagine them with little lights blinking, and those lights begin to send out tendrils to one another, kind of like the way that a pea pod would send tendrils up uh, in your garden up a vine. And this creates um, all kinds of places where new learning and new insights can be hung on. And the last thing is that we are activating people's imaginations. Once we begin to connect things, we remember things, we, cre we, we create connections, then we can imagine new possibilities. So we trigger, we use different techniques for triggering and eliciting memories and stories. I've given you one today, story collage. There's lots of other ways. We talked briefly about um, using time, um, timelines as a way, but we want to be really diligent um, about eliciting stories. We want to give people permission to recall their experiences. We want to help them to build connections with themselves and with others. And we want to then say what new behaviors as you walk into this new world with this new understanding, how is that going to change your, your behavior, your performance, the way that you're, the way that you're going to do the work that you do and how you do it. So, um, I'd like to um, just kind of wrap up on these last two slides with sort of five, um, five strategies um, of, how you can, of how you can get started. And someone else mentioned this in, in, their, in their comments already. Um, they talked about you got to create orchestrated and unorchestrated opportunities for people to share stories. So our learning events or our e-learning, or the um, however we're doing informal or mobile learning, or all of the different tools in our toolbox, um, those are orchestrated. And how are we creating opportunities for people to to share to share stories? And are we creating spaces and times and rhythms and cadences in which people in unstructured ways are both encouraged and having opportunities to share stories? And that kind of gets to the, the, the second idea, which is creating um, spaces in our organizations that promote informal extemporaneous interactions. And obviously, you know, around the coffee, in the coffee room or in the kitchen, those are obvious places. But, you know, what else are we doing? And have we thought about whether or not we're creating story spaces that, that promote people to, to interact in those ways? I think it's really critical that we look in our organization and say, are we paying attention to um, relationship skill building? Oh, I'm going to take one little comment here from, from Renee Looper. If the learning is virtual with limited verbal interactions, how would you recommend using and encouraging storytelling? Oh, great. Renee, I'm going to come back to that. Maybe we can open up, uh, Sarah, take note of that one. Maybe let's open up with Renny's question in just a minute when I um, finish the next slide. That's a great one, Renny. Thanks. Um, so I, I, I believe it's really critical that we spend time on the development of relationship skills um, and that we build these competencies um, and make that a priority throughout the organization. And as I said, story-based communication skills um, from my research, and I have an assessment instrument, um, as well as a 360-degree um, coaching and feedback, there are ways to actually um, develop these skills, and the good news is, is that everyone has them. Lastly, because I really want to leave as much time as we can for questions, um, be, be very purposeful about 
folding story-based activities into your existing training programs and orient instructional designers to story principles. A lot of this is probably intuitive. It's probably things that they think about already. We know that they do storyboarding. We know that they're trying to look how do we move from one topic to another. We know that now we're starting to look at gamification. Um, you know, a lot of you talked about role playing and um, and all of these. Um, Wendy's got another great question. Wendy, this is super. Let's also make sure we answer this one. She says, "How do you encourage direct reports to feel more comfortable with you?" as a new boss using storytelling. Definitely, we'll, we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so lastly, I would say um, this stuff is not as self-evident, and maybe this is the place where I'm doing a little bit of the back padding, or, or maybe this is the self-promotion, but, but really, um, you know, there are some things that people, your trainers and your instructional designers, need to learn and understand in order to be effective. We didn't even scratch the surface in terms of the group dynamics. Wendy's question starts to get at that um, about, you know, how do you deal with group dynamics? How do you deal with uh, live storytelling that's either happening or not happening, as well as how do you design? So with that, um, Sarah, I want to hand back um, to you and start taking some of these great questions from, from folks. Okay, great. Thank you so much. And uh, we do, we probably have about like four minutes for just that live Q&A, but attendees, go ahead and send those questions in now. And uh, while we wait for those questions to come in, uh, let me share a little bit um, about how you can keep in touch. Uh, Terrence's website is called makingstories.net. You can also reach him on his email. And all of his books are available online to purchase. And if you would like to contact us, you can always stay in touch with the uh, normal social media networks. And you can also register for our weekly Wednesday webinars at hrdqu. Dot com, And we are also excited to announce we're hosting the first ever five-day ROI boot camp at the end of April. So that should be really cool. So go ahead and sign up there. And let me go ahead and scroll up. I know you said you wanted to touch on Raina's uh, yeah, question sorry, first. I did your name wrong. I, I greatly apologize. Let's start with hers, Sarah. And she's, her question again is, if the learning is virtual with limited verbal interactions, how would you recommend using and encouraging um, storytelling. So um, I, I think, you know, people are not necessarily always co-located. You don't always have the opportunity. Um, one of the suggestions made by someone else about pre-work is a really good way. So it may be through the learning management system. Like, let's use this webinar as, as, as an example. You know, we could set up um, on the registration page um, an, an, an open-ended question, maybe even a short story. Um, you know, for example, I could have put a story about utilizing the story collage with Princess Cruz, you know, as maybe as like a teaser. And then I could say, and what stories do any of you, what, what short anecdotes do any of you might have to share around um, recent, uh, recent times when you use stories in your learning? And then even in a simple registration form, people might type those in and then we would maybe collect those, maybe we would email and share them with people ahead of time. Maybe we would post them on a SharePoint. So the, there are those types of ways. And then there are really, there is such a wealth of social media tools. I don't even know where to begin. We could spend a whole series of webinars just on storytelling, leveraging social media, uh, social media tools. Um, and so you can use um, some of those. I hope that's a start, Rennie. Feel free to ping me um, and the HRDQ uh, with follow-up on that, and we could go a lot deeper in that, but hope that's a starting point. Um, I want to go, I'm sorry, go ahead, Sarah. Oh, no, go, uh, do you want to answer Wendy's question? Yeah, definitely. Okay, she perfect. Can encourage direct reports to feel more comfortable with you as a new boss using storytelling. I think that goes back to if, if I, if I model, I mean, one of the things as a boss is sometimes we enact our intentions versus announce them. I'm going to repeat that. As a leader, you enact, E-N-A-C-T, your intentions versus announce them. So maybe the way to actually start is to create um, a, some, shared, some shared experience, even if it's something as simple as, as taking them out for coffee or... Um, um, 
setting a pattern of walking by their walking by their desks and maybe asking an appreciative question about some objects on their desk and then maybe slowly just offering a um, something personal about yourself if they had a baseball on their desk then maybe you talk about um, you know your love of the San Francisco Giants and the last game that you went to or how your son or daughter you know went to the World Series for Little League or you know you break the ice right stories are really good for breaking the ice and then you move to more, to more complex forms of storytelling where hopefully as you um, share with them both your successes and failures and I would say that that as a boss look more for slowly ways that you can be vulnerable with that with that person um, by sharing with them ex experiences um, and that will build up a pattern that will open up the opportunity for for more rich storytelling between yourself and them all right great thank you um, and Terrence would you just to like uh, add any final thoughts before I go ahead and wrap this session up I, I want to just notice that um, we've had great participation. It, it makes me almost want to cry that um, the Star Wars technique of us all being piped in in some virtual space, seeing each other and, and interacting is not quite prime time yet <laughs> uh, because you know this, this topic really is, is just rich and, and we've had great participation from, from people. And I just hope that we hear more from people and hope we have an opportunity to interact on this stuff again real soon. Great, yes. And I know um, you said something about the story collage white paper. We are, that is actually up on our blog right now and we are going to go ahead and include that in the follow-up email with all the answered uh, questions to the Q&A. So that is unfortunately all the time we have for today. Yeah. One last thing, um, mm -hmm. take these last seconds as you, as you leave. If there are questions, I know Sarah said that we would answer any question that was um, emailed and sent. So even though we didn't get to the question now, um, we do commit to getting back to you with um, all the questions asked, even the questions that you might um, type in now in the moment or two before you leave. So just want to thank you again for your time, feel free to um, give us any last questions, and we will commit to getting back to you. Okay, great. So we appreciate your time, and we hope you found today's webinar informative.